In the 1990s, the disguised serial bank robber terrorizes the Chicago area. Expert with weapons, aware of police procedure, and fearless, he hits hard and disappears fast. Police and the FBI realize the only way to stop him is to catch him in the act. But his desperate violence proves impossible to predict. The average bank robbery yields roughly $3,000. Yet some criminals risk everything for the take. In suburban Chicago, a disguised gunman began a series of robberies, growing more violent with each one. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Tracking the robber's movements, agents discovered he wasn't alone and would do anything to avoid capture. March 5th, 1990, Chicago, Illinois. $1,000. At a bank on the city's south side, employees began what they thought was a normal work day. The neighborhood was quiet until 10 a.m. That the disguised gunman threatened to kill anyone who didn't follow his orders. The tellers knew not to interfere. It was over in seconds. When they were safe, they called police. The Chicago police patrol officers closest to the bank responded first. The witnesses reported that the robber was a white male, about six feet tall. But they didn't see details of his features because of his disguise. He wore gloves and carried a police scanner. The man was aggressive, handling his semi-automatic handgun with confidence. He left no fingerprints, and security cameras revealed no other immediate clues. Police canvassed the area, hoping to find other witnesses. A woman who lived near the bank reported that she thought she had seen the robber. She said that at about the time of the robbery, she saw a man who seemed to be wearing a fake beard get into a small four-door sedan. She did not get the plates, but she did give officers a description of the car. Checking every similar car in the area, they soon found one they believed was the robber's getaway vehicle abandoned a few blocks from the bank. The officer approached with caution in case someone was still inside. But it was empty, except for a paper towel covering the broken ignition. A records check revealed the car had been stolen from a mall parking lot four days earlier. Later processing produced no leads to the robber. Bank robbery is a federal offense, so police contacted the Chicago FBI. Hi, this is Keith. Supervisory senior resident agent Bill Keefe had handled dozens of bank robbery calls. 
At that time, we were extremely busy with bank robberies. We had had two on one day. We were running sometimes as many as three robberies a week. Most were committed by amateurs who went in without a plan and were caught quickly. As I said, shoemakers already over here. But when the bank robbery squad reviewed the reports on the South Side robbery, they noted how clean the assault was, obviously well planned. They believed it was not the bearded assailant's first robbery and would not be his last. Two months later, the robber with the fake beard hit a bank in the suburb of Libertyville. Not satisfied with cash drawers this time, he ordered a teller to open the vault. Don't you try anything. Come on, let's go. He said his police scanner would let him know if anyone hit the silent alarm. The robber escaped with thousands of dollars in cash. But this time, a teller got the license plate number from his getaway car. While Libertyville police looked for the car, Chicago FBI agents interviewed the tellers. Special Agent Hank Schmidt learned the gunman was more aggressive this time. He controlled people with the weapon. Uh, he would intimidate them by putting the gun up towards their face. He pointed the gun directly at someone when he talked to them, uh, which was intimidating to the, the tellers and the customers. Although interviews yielded no clues, police did find the getaway car, abandoned a few blocks from the bank. Again, the vehicle had been stolen from a mall three days earlier. And as before, the thief used a towel to hide the broken ignition. FBI Special Agent Dave Childry was part of the robbery squad. The squad uncovered an earlier robbery in Wilmette, Illinois, believed to be committed by the same man. One surveillance camera photo provided a frightening clue. There was a very good picture of the robber taken in which he was using what we call a weaver stance. This is a shooting position taught to police officers. It was taught to FBI agents. And if you have been taught to shoot like that, you recognize it. This person might have had some law enforcement training. If so, he would know how these investigations work, and he could prove very difficult to catch. The local press dubbed him the Bearded Bandit. Investigators took advantage of the coverage to ask citizens for help. They published enhanced stills from the robberies, hoping someone would recognize him despite the disguise. We put his picture on the news. He did wear a beard, a fake beard and mustache uh, and a ball cap. So after running those pictures, we were not getting any tips from the public. In November 1990, the elusive bandit hit a bank in Wheeling, Illinois. A teller hit the alarm before he was told not to. Over his scanner, the gunman heard the police responding. He didn't leave the bank, which would be the normal reaction of bank robbers. They're there to rob the bank. They're not there to get involved in a shootout with the police. He stayed in the bank while the police were responding and held the gun up to the cashier and counted down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. It seemed he knew how long he had before police responded. More evidence he might be a cop. Further. Up there, higher, 
As the robberies continued, it looked like the bandit purposely chose targets in different jurisdictions to complicate the investigation. No bank was ever hit the second time. The robberies would be on the other end of the suburban area against Lake Michigan, and then they would be out in Schaumburg or Elk Grove Village or up north in a lake county such as Libertyville. As he struck in new suburbs, the FBI had to coordinate with a growing number of police departments. Palatine, Illinois Police Chief John Kozel, a detective sergeant at the time, learned of the case and that the bandits' getaway cars belonged to shopping mall employees stolen at the beginning of their shifts. He would steal one of the employee cars knowing that it would not be reported stolen for approximately eight hours. So he knew he had eight hours to get the vehicle to where he needed to put it before anyone would even discover it missing and it would become hot on the system. When dumping the cars, the robber did his best to interfere with the ongoing investigation, wiping them clean of fingerprints and leaving no trace of himself behind. It was very apparent that he was aware of evidence gathering techniques, of police methods. In the end, agents found nothing of evidentiary value in any of the cars. Since the cars didn't help identify the bandit, investigators followed every conceivable lead that might. They visited theatrical shops around the city hoping a salesperson might recognize the man with the fake beard as a customer. Again, nothing. The bearded bandit committed seven armed bank robberies in the Chicago area between January 1990 and February 1991. Then the robberies stopped. We went over what we had done to that point in time, looked for things we might have missed. Maybe he'd been incarcerated somewhere. Maybe he'd moved out of state. Maybe he was dead. We just didn't know. The bandit's trail stayed cold for nine months. On November 4th, 1991, Palatine police officer Kevin Maher was working the day shift A dispatcher in training rode along to learn procedure. I was heading southbound on Quinton Road when I saw a vehicle heading northbound. And I looked in my side view mirror and I thought what I saw was an expired tag. So I made a U-turn and I was telling my ride along that we were gonna go up and see if this vehicle had expired plates. And if it did, I would conduct a traffic stop and show him how we conduct a traffic stop and how we punch all the numbers into the computer. It was supposed to be a routine stop. The person driving the vehicle swerved over to the side of the road and jammed on the brakes. Maher's first instinct was to protect his passenger. The bearded bandit was back. In November 1991, a routine Chicago area traffic stop erupted in violence a when a man shot Palatine police officer Kevin Maher I was in a state of shock because it was broad daylight, it was 11 o'clock, and it was a quiet residential street, and it was a basic ambush. And after he fired the first round, the first round came through the windshield and struck me in the shoulder, and glass from the windshield struck me in the left ear.
The officer down call went out on the Illinois State Police emergency radio network. From more than a dozen surrounding suburbs, police and emergency personnel rushed to the scene. Maher realized one of the shots that pierced his windshield was aimed dead center and might have hit him in the head had he not moved to protect his passenger and reversed the car. While paramedics treated Maher, officers questioned him. As a police officer, he was a perfect witness. Trained in recalling details, he gave them a description of the gunman, the car's license plates, the type of gun, and the direction in which the attacker escaped. We got a male white, uh, six foot, 200 pounds, beard, hat, last scene going south from the scene. So let's spread out, start looking for the car, which way you want to go back. Police fanned out to find the shooter. More than 100 officers joined the search. Three blocks from the location of the attack, police found the shooter's vehicle. It had been reported stolen from a mall parking lot five days earlier. Palatine Police Chief John Kozel realized the grave danger. When someone is willing to shoot a police officer um, on a routine traffic stop, we all realize that he, he's willing to shoot at anyone. His determination to escape is much greater than his concern for the safety of anyone. That would be a law enforcement officer, a citizen on the street. Uh, when you're willing to shoot a policeman, you're willing to shoot anyone. Kozel helped coordinate the search for the deadly gunman. We immediately set up a perimeter with the assistance of the state, county, and local officers in the area. We had canines on the scene. Uh, we had a chopper in the air. Uh, we notified the schools in the area to stay locked down. Evidence technicians began to process the car. The ignition was broken, the damage covered by a paper towel. They looked for fingerprints that might help them identify the perpetrator, but found none. Canine handlers brought in their dogs, which are trained to remember a scent from a specified place, then follow only that scent, ignoring others. But the trail ended not far from the vehicle. Despite the massive effort, the suspect somehow slipped away. In addition to taking it personal when one of our officers is shot, uh, we all know that a citizen is much more likely to be injured or killed, and uh, we work that much harder to uh, bring him to justice. For more resources, they called in the FBI and Supervisory Special Agent Bill Keefe. I was asked to come over to the Palatine Police Department by the Chief of Police. There had been a composite sketch drawn, and everybody was reviewing the circumstances of the shooting. For nearly two years, Keefe and his squad had been working the bearded bandit case. I had asked uh, if we could look at the car that was found, and when I looked at the ignition, this was our bank robber. 
After being treated, Officer Maher came to the station to look at surveillance photos of the bearded bandit. He said the bank robber did look like the man who shot him. We surmised that he was on his way to do a bank robbery. He knew once the officer ran the plate, the car would come back stolen. He also knew that with the guns he had in his vehicle, it's not something he could conceal if the officer walked up to the vehicle. The bearded bandit had made a huge leap in violence. This guy wasn't going to go away. We were going to have to come up with a very innovative way to either identify him and charge him, or that we were going to have to catch him in the act. Chief Kozel brought the many investigators together. After the initial search, uh, uh, we set up a uh, multi-jurisdictional task force here at our police department. We had uh, the FBI, the uh, state police, Cook County Sheriff's Police, and all the local agencies uh, from our area and those involved in the Fear of Bank Robber series. Since their suspect seemed to know police procedure, they adjusted it. We learned we had a, a violent bank robber that was using a scanner. We were no longer giving out the location of the bank over the air. We were giving out a code number for each particular bank. In progress. Go ahead and give us code the task force hoped patrol officers in the area also, could uh, use the codes to respond to robbery calls without the, the bandit banks. realizing it. Especially you undercover agents. Confident that the bearded bandit would resume his crime spree eventually, police began doing spot checks of banks throughout the region. On November 18th, two weeks after the shooting, Elk Grove Village, Illinois police officers saw nothing suspicious at one bank on their list. But later that morning, a woman leaving a nearby business did. Two people in obvious disguises entering the bank. Two weeks after a police shooting in the Chicago area that was linked to the bearded bandit, the gunman reappeared in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, this time with an accomplice. 911, can I help you? While a witness outside the bank called police, there's something very strange going on here. The robbers struck. The bandit demanded money from the vault, his accomplice standing guard. 911 dispatch, aware of the bearded bandit, used a prearranged code to alert officers. 2130, 2132, code green. Without revealing information over the police scanner. They also alerted the FBI. Special Agent Hank Schmidt realized the new danger. The big concern is that the robber, in some cases, discharges the weapon when he's using it to gesture at the employees. So the potential for violence is always there. The numbers obviously increase if we have two people that are armed. In the bank, the manager explained they could not get into the time delay vault. Hey, ma'am, can you hold The dispatcher instructed the witness outside to leave in case there was gunplay. Move it! With the money from the cash drawers, the robbers fled. Unaware the police had been called, the teller hit the alarm. Elk Grove Village officers approached with their sirens off, quietly surrounding the bank. If the robbers were still inside and heard police, they might take hostages. Officers were in even more danger, according to Palatine Chief John Kozel. For the first time, we had two bearded individuals rob a bank. That, of course, increased our sense of urgency even more. Now we had two armed gunmen to deal with uh, when law enforcement arrives at these banks. 2600, can you uh, call the bank, uh, find out if they Through the dispatcher, the police talked with bank employees. The manager said the robbers had left. The officers had to be sure. The robbers could be holding a gun on the manager, forcing her to lie. Okay, we're gonna need to get 
The dispatcher asked them to send one employee outside to talk to police. The manager gave them the description of the woman chosen to go. Twenty six hundred had the official come out. Okay, I see her coming out. Hi, are you aware there was a bank alarm here? Yes. Is there anybody hurt inside? The employee assured them the assailants were gone and no one was injured inside. All right, guys, the bank is clear, go on inside. The officers moved in to clear the bank for certain. One of the witnesses uh, told us that she believed that the second person, a smaller person, uh, was possibly a woman disguised as a man. After the Elk Grove Village robbery, police recovered two cars with the bandit's signature ignition covering. It was more evidence of his criminal sophistication. To cleanse himself after leaving the bank, he would drop the one off a, a block from the bank uh, that he had just gotten into that all the witnesses had seen him uh, leave the bank in, and he would uh, go a few blocks away and get into the other vehicle that he had left there previous, and then since cleanse himself from that first hot vehicle. All of the cars were similar, according to Special Agent Dave Childry. We were able to kind of key in the cars by the type, the make, the size, the non-visibility of them. They were just everyday cars. He was stealing them then letting them sit for several days before using them as getaway cars. The task force asked to be notified of similar cars stolen from area shopping malls. We were successful in getting information on cars of that type that were stolen in the northwest suburbs and in the city of Chicago. We would put that information out on a weekly basis. Agent Scott Backen from the FBI and Sergeant Steve Peterson from Chicago PD actually went to every roll call of approximately 50 to 60 law enforcement agencies and spoke to the individual officers on the need to find these cars. Those personal visits mean a lot more than just putting something out on a teletype. Somewhere in the metro area, they hoped to find a getaway car after the bandit stole it, but before he used it in a robbery. Weeks later, Officer Tom Polinski was checking an apartment building parking lot in Niles, Illinois, when he spotted a stolen car on their list. It did look like the bearded bandits' work. The agreement was if they found one of those and it did turn out to be stolen when they ran the uh, license plate that they would back off and notify us. Uh, that happened, uh, we set up a surveillance on that vehicle. FBI agents and Niles police officers and detectives watched from an empty apartment overlooking the stolen car 24 hours a day. On December 13th, we found out that the Rolling Meadows police had located another stolen car that was at all probability one of the bearded bandits' cars. Chief Kozel was sure they were right. These two particular vehicles were both stolen out of uh, large mall areas. Both were owned by employees of those malls. Um, the MO was perfect. They set up surveillance on the second car in Rolling Meadows, too. Rolling Meadows PD stepped up. They shared uh, time, detectives, intelligence, sat with our agents out there 24 hours a day. To further ensure the bandit did not slip away, the FBI wanted to install tracking devices in the vehicles. But they couldn't do so in the parking lots. Late one night, agents removed the two cars. and replaced them with lookalikes for a few hours. 
It was a risky move. The thief could return at any time and spot the agents or the decoy cars. At the FBI garage, technicians installed the remote tracking devices in each vehicle. They also equipped the cars with remote kill switches that would allow agents to shut down the engines from a distance. They put the cars back and waited. Days passed. There was a nagging doubt in, in all of our minds that maybe we had been discovered, that perhaps he had seen one of us or a police officer going in and out of this apartment they were using to watch the car in Niles, that he had seen somebody near the car in Rolling Meadows, and that he was just going to back off these cars and never come back. We weren't sure. We just didn't know, but we, we were committed to watching these cars until something told us otherwise. After a week, the vigil paid off. A van pulled up, and a man approached one of the cars. This was, in my mind, a do-or-die effort. This is, this is going to be our only shot. If we miss this, he's going to know where I'm doing. They hoped they could peacefully end the bandit's crime spree. But no one had forgotten the last time the gunman was cornered. In 1991, as Chicago area investigators watched two stolen cars they believed were going to be used in the bearded bandit's next holdup, a man entered one of the cars. Special Agent Hank Schmidt believed it was their suspect. Uh, he matched the general physical description of the, uh, the person we were looking for as the uh, bearded robber. We have a man, we have a man. The man had been dropped off at the vehicle by someone driving a van. Mini wagon? In a white van. Heading southbound down the alley. When he drove away, the van followed. Investigators could not identify either driver. They had to be careful. If the bearded bandit and his accomplice spotted a tail, they might start shooting. But FBI technicians had installed a tracking device in the car, allowing agents to follow at a distance. The suspect parked the stolen car near a suburban bank. Mini wagon is parked. The man is behind him. Hearing the news, Supervisory Special Agent Bill Keith believed they finally found their target. When the vehicle showed up in the vicinity of a bank, our adrenaline really was pumped up, and we really knew that we were going to have it. This car was likely the first getaway car for the next day's robbery. Agents believe the two suspects would next pick up the second stolen car in Rolling Meadows. Standing down. They were right. That vehicle was also equipped with a tracking device. Surveillance agents followed that car, believed to be a secondary getaway car, to a hardware store about 20 miles from the bank where the pair left it. Both suspects in the van, agents no longer had the benefit of a tracking device and had to stay close. They followed the van into Hanover Park, Illinois, and watched as it pulled up to a townhouse. Well, 
Now, Special Agent Dave Childry could identify the people inside. We had a license plate and two vague descriptions of people, a man and a woman. Normal record checks on that license plate would tell us that that van belonged to Jeffrey and Jill Erickson. The FBI and police worked through the night to learn more. We had done uh, a lot of research, calling police departments, trying to see who these people were. We were looking for a, a previous arrest record, uh, which we didn't find. During this process, we had received some information that Jeffrey Erickson had been a police officer. In 1986, Jeffrey Erickson worked as a patrol officer in a Chicago suburb. He distinguished himself as a skilled marksman but he was uninterested in the everyday requirements of the job, traffic stops, paperwork. He was about to be fired when he resigned. Records also showed that Jeffrey Erickson opened a used bookstore in early 1991, during the time the bearded bandit was on hiatus. It appeared he and his wife, Jill, a university chemistry student, led a double life, using bank robbery money to build a middle-class existence. He might not have seemed threatening on the surface, but Special Agent Schmidt knew he was. Because he's a trained individual, he knows how we're going to react. He can plan ahead for that, and uh, if he's trained with a weapon, he's going to be more professional in the way he handles that weapon, and he's going to uh, be a, a bigger threat to us. Investigators considered waiting until the Ericsons approached a bank the next day, but decided not to risk a shootout near employees and customers. We had enough that we did not have to get him in the vicinity of a bank. The safest approach would be when he came to the car, the stolen car, we would arrest him. While surveillance units watched the suspect's home, A SWAT team set up near the car in the hardware store parking lot. Police Chief John Kozel. The SWAT team set up on the, uh, the vehicles were very well aware of his background and uh, knew that he may shoot first, and they were taking that into account. By the morning, they were ready for the Ericsons to make their move. About mid-morning, the surveillance uh, units advised us that the van was, in fact, moving from the residence with uh, at least two people. They were heading in the direction of where we were watching the, uh, the stolen car. The surveillance team advised us that Mr. Erickson had got out of the vehicle in an adjoining parking lot. Yeah, the driver's in the van still. He's, he's walking uh, west. The FBI had installed a kill switch in the stolen car, which they could use to turn off the engine from a distance. Uh, we watched him uh, come around the corner from that other parking lot, go to the vehicle, and enter the vehicle and start that vehicle. Erickson was distracted by the car trouble. Okay, let's go in. The SWAT team moved in. Back out of the car! Out of the car! Put your hands where I can see Get back out of that bag! Out of the car, put your hands where I can see I know that the pressure uh, of to car. shoot or not shoot is a split-second decision. Get, get your get hands up. Back in there, get out of the car. And most law enforcement officers don't want to have to shoot an individual if they don't have to. Uh, no one wants to take a life that way. Uh, we felt like we controlled him. Out of the car! Slowly! After twice reaching for his bag, Erickson finally followed orders. 
If he'd come out of the bag with a gun, it would have been an entirely different situation. I asked him as we were transporting him after the arrest to the federal lockup, you being a former police officer, you would know that a gesture like that could get you shot. And he looked at me and he said, well, I figured you'd shoot me in the head and it would be over with quickly. In the car, agents searched Erickson's bag and found the bearded bandit's tools, loaded guns, a police scanner, gloves, a beard and a wig. His bank robbery kit in that bag, it was very helpful to the case. Uh, without that information or that evidence, we just arrested a car thief. Having Jeffrey Erickson safely in custody was only half the job. In the adjoining parking lot, the SWAT team approached the van. It might be Jill Erickson inside. Agents scrambled to follow. The chase barreled through 11 suburban jurisdictions, reaching speeds of 110 miles per hour. A roadblock didn't work. And she had fired multiple rounds uh, out of that van. Uh, either at the pursuing agents or other people in traffic. Uh, it was a big concern for the agents that she might hit an innocent civilian. Agents shot out the rear tires of the van. But the driver was not giving up. In 1991, the suspected bank robber led police and FBI agents on a dangerous chase through the Chicago suburbs. The fleeing van turned into an area that investigators knew had no outlet. They blocked the road. As the van charged them, they had to fire. They saw movement inside. Then, an FBI agent cautiously approached. The driver was wounded, a single self-inflicted gunshot. It was Jill Erickson. Later that night, in the hospital, she died. Special Agent Hank Schmidt. We believed it may have been a, a pact that they had both come up with that they would not be arrested. Uh, she that day carried out her part of the pack, and that day he decided, uh, for whatever reason, he didn't. Inside the van were spent cartridge casings, blood, fibers, other ammunition, uh, other weapons. There was a rifle with uh, several hundred rounds of ammunition. That whole neighborhood became an, an evidentiary nightmare. There were bullets uh, that Jill had fired, uh, stuck in the side of houses, in cars, on the street. The FBI obtained a federal search warrant for the Erickson's home.
We found some loose cash, but what impressed me was the amount of firepower in the house. An arrest at that home would have, would have evolved into a shootout. In that home, there was a weapon everywhere that you would find a picture or a statue or a knickknack in any other home. Among the weapons found was the 223 caliber semi-automatic assault rifle used in the attack on Officer Kevin Maher. Chief John Kozel realized a shootout would have been deadly to both sides. The weapons in his home were as good as any law enforcement has as far as firepower goes. Most of the long guns he had, those, that type of ammunition would zip right through an officer's bulletproof vest. Another discovery in the house spoke to the couple's mindset. One of the things that we found quite uh, ironic was the television was on and the VCR was on, and there was a Bonnie and Clyde tape in the VCR, and it was queued up to the uh, point where the uh, Bonnie and Clyde are being shot to death in the movie, and it was obvious that that was something they watched before they went out and did their bank robberies. Though one robber was dead and one in custody, the violence was not yet over. Jeffrey Erickson's trial began on July 13, 1992. The evidence compiled against him was strong. In all conversations with the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, the trial was going very well. They were very uh, uh, upbeat about it, and the uh, evidence was, uh, in their mind, uh, going to be enough to convict him. But then, after court adjourned on July 20th, 1992, two deputy U.S. Marshals loaded Erickson and several jail inmates onto an elevator. Erickson was still dressed for court. The prisoners were headed for a van that would take them to the Metropolitan Correctional Center. By the time the elevator reached the parking garage, Erickson had somehow escaped his cuffs. Erickson shot U.S. Marshal Bill Frakes in the back and head, killing him. Ambushed, Frakes had not had time to draw his weapon. As the gunman ran for the street, court security officer and former Chicago police detective Harry Belwomany confronted him. Erickson shot the police veteran in the chest. But before Bellwomany died, he got off four rounds, fatally wounding Erickson. The gunman was 40 feet from the crowded streets when he died. The thing is, all these resources were brought to bear on an individual. He was captured and was being tried in court. You, you think the case is over? But unfortunately, the only person that could stop this individual turned out to be a very brave, courageous policeman named Harry Bellomini, who, while dying, shot and killed Jeff Erickson. A newlywed, Bill Frakes was a promising young lawman just nine months into his career. Harry Bellomini was a 31-year veteran. Two of his children are also Chicago police officers carrying on his legacy.